Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Porn and Capitalism, live from my new digs here in Austin, Texas. Welcome. Using my old equipment because, uh, you know, sometimes that's what you have when you move. You're only left with what you had. Not that I divorced Justin Essamacher. I'm kidding, obviously. We're still doing the Open Mics podcast. Um, Next week's episode actually should be very fun. Our going away episode. We banked it, did it ahead of time. But uh, I'm down here in Austin, Texas. Last night, uh, my girlfriend Genevieve and I moved down here, got to our uh, our new digs, as I like to call it. It's a very cool house, I'll be honest. It's a pretty cool house. And um, Austin is pretty cool so far. Last night, uh, we did a show, a little showcase, a little bar show, a little some guest spots out in, uh, in Lakeway. At LT's Pub, shout out Joyce Taus and Chris Castles having us on the show. Very fun time. After that, we went over to the Vulcan Gas Company, said what up to Philip Garcia, another good friend of ours, hilarious comedian from uh, from Fort Worth. And then we went over to Creek in the Cave on their first night opening. It was amazing. We missed the show, but we hung out after, and it was a lot of fun, man. It was just cool being down there. You can feel the energy, dude, in Austin. You can feel it. It is, it's amazing to me because you can see the boom happening in real time. Like, I don't know how many people really get to experience a boom in real time like that. And you just see, like, when you drive into Austin, you just see cranes. Like, if you want to know if a city's going up or down, look how many cranes are there. Because if there are cranes in the sky, it really means money's being spent, things are getting built. And it's happening for a reason. It's not just happening for no reason. It's happening because people are moving here. This is this is the new mecca for a lot of things. Obviously, stand-up comedy. I just saw an article today about Joe Rogan's new club that he's going to be opening up. Actually, about 20 minutes from where we're staying. Ayo. Uh, so that'll be very cool. But, I mean, just overall, you're watching what's happening. People are coming to Austin, Texas. Why? There's freedom. Texas in general. A lot of people have been going there because of freedom. But why Austin? Austin has this mix of freedom with, um, you could, I guess you could call it liberalism in maybe a traditional sense. People talk about keep Austin weird, right? It's a very weird town. It's already a weird town. I had a crazy weird day today just being weird. And uh, it's a very weird town. Since being here, I don't think I've been to anything that's a chain. I've been here a day and a half. I don't think I've been to anything that's a chain. Everything's like a local, like, cool little version of some, like, you know, sushi thing. I went to a sushi place today. It was called Haiku Sushi. Not bad, first of all. Uh, Mostly because I didn't get chicken. The service? Not particularly great. I don't know if we get racist service because we're an interracial couple, but sometimes it feels like that. We were talking about that. We were like, do you think we get worse service because, you know, we're an interracial couple and they're like, ah, we'll just treat them like black people and put them in the back. I don't know, but me and Genevieve were talking about that earlier. Like, uh, d- d- have you noticed that every time we go out to eat, we always get sat in the back? And I was like, yeah, that does happen a lot. What's the deal with that? Why does that always happen? I don't know, but it does always happen pretty much all the freaking time. So it's, you know, I don't know if it's racism. I don't know if it's bad luck. I don't know if it's a little bit of both, but it does happen a lot. And it is, even in Austin at a fucking sushi restaurant where the wait staff is people of color. I don't know if they were Asian. I don't know if they were Mexican. I had no fucking idea because they spoke English, but maybe they were Filipino. I don't know. They spoke perfect English, so I have no idea if they were Mexican, but they weren't white, okay? Um, And I don't know how authentic, because they didn't look Japanese either. They didn't look Japanese, so that's, and with a mask, you know, Austin is a little bit more hardcore about the masks, I will tell you that, because I went in to uh, buy some blunt wraps earlier, blunts, baby, you gotta have them, gotta have the wraps, went in to buy some blunt wraps, wasn't wearing my mask, because I'm a Dallas guy. All right, I've been to Dallas for three months. I'm a fucking Dallas guy. I walk in with no mask. I wait in line. As I'm getting to the front of the line, the guy behind the counter who's also behind a thing of glass, he's like, hey, man, do you need a mask? I was like, huh? He's like, do you need a mask? 
And he's holding one up. He's like, do you need one? I was like, sure. I'll take a mask. He gave it to me. I put it on. I was like, oh, a free mask. I will collect masks like that in Austin. I swear to God. Because I'm running out of those things. And I don't know what the deal is anymore. I default no mask at this point. But if you give me a free one, I'll wear it. And I'll wear it out the door and take it home with me. And then I got another mask. Because here's the thing. I'm not buying any more masks. I don't care if we get a fourth stimulus. I don't care if we get $2,000 a month. Right? Like the like Rashida Tlaib wants. Right? Like the squad wants. I don't give a shit. If you give me $5 million, I am never buying another mask. There are too many masks out there. It's like a used car versus a new car. I will never buy a new car unless I'm balling. Because there's so many used cars that just make more sense to buy. Give me a free mask, 7-Eleven. It was a shell, actually. I didn't go to the 7-Eleven because it was a... Uh, it was harder to get into. You ever make your gas buying decisions based on which gas station is easier to get into? You ever do that? I do that all the time. I'm like, which gas station can I realistically make it into? Because I think that's the one that I'm going to go to. And there's places in California where literally across the street, there's a it's it's it goes from like 3:30 or back then it was 3:30 I don't know it's probably like 3:75 on one side of the gas uh, on one side of the road and on the other side of the road it's like 4:75 and you're like what why and I think part of it is because they're like look we have a better location some of the people driving here are rich as fuck and quite frankly don't care what the price is it's a driver driving a car that isn't even theirs paying for gas with with money that isn't theirs. So I think a lot of people in California are just like, yeah, dude, I don't care. Just get the get the gas. It's easier to get in this gas station. We'll just go to that one. And then they charge you an extra, an extra dollar. Bastards. Bastards. But I do live in an oil state. It's fun. I like living in an oil state. Speaking of an oil state, I was in Oklahoma on Tuesday. We were at Gushers. It was myself. It was Genevieve. It was Justin Essamacher and the hilarious Philip Garcia, as I mentioned. We were in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Shout out to Gushers Lounge. Very fun show. But it was also the owner Kyle's birthday show. And Kyle is the fucking man, if you don't know. And they were having a bit of a party, you could say, for his birthday, right? And at the end of the night, after the show, as we're getting ready to drive back down to Texas... A fucking horse with a cowboy on it rides into the bar. And when I say rides into the bar, I mean the dude riding the horse rode through doors to get into the hallway and then rode into, literally into the bar and did a dance on the fucking dance floor to country music. And I'll be honest, I was pretty lit at this point. I was high as shit because it's Oklahoma. We're having a good time, right? And I'm looking, I'm like, there's a fucking horse in the bar. What the fuck is happening right now? That's the craziest thing. You see a horse in the bar. And the thing is, you're in a small town in Oklahoma. Ardmore has about 50,000 people. But it's a smaller town in Oklahoma. And all of a sudden, I'm just like, this is fucking nuts, bro. And everyone around me is just like, yeah, this is normal. We just got a horse in the bar. Ain't a big deal. Ain't a big deal at all. We just got a horse in the bar. What you gonna do about it? Got a horse in the bar. I'm gonna order another drink. I'm gonna dance with the horse. That's a good looking horse. I'm gonna have a couple more drinks. That horse is starting to look real good. You know what I'm saying? You ever, you ever have a couple of extra shots of whiskey and all of a sudden that horse pussy's looking real good. You know what I'm saying? I don't think anyone's gonna fuck the horse. Um, <laughs> I hope not. I don't know. I don't know. It's Ardmore. Who knows, right? Oh, shit. Very fun show, though. Again, shout out Kyle. Shout out Tony. It's Kyle's wife. They own Gushers. They're awesome. They're awesome. I don't give a shit what anyone says. They are fucking awesome. I love Ardmore, Oklahoma. Can't wait to be back. Um, But I'm in Austin now. And I got to keep Austin weird. And that's great. Keep Austin weird is great. But, uh... (laughs) Please stop seating me and my black girlfriend at the back of restaurants. Please. Can you do that? I thought Austin was super liberal. I thought a beautiful interracial couple with big hair like us, you'd want to seat us right at the front to signal to people how not racist you are. No, put us in the back and give us the worst service. 
<laughs> I'm not trying to shit on Haiku because their food was good. But the service, not good. I didn't order sushi. I'll be honest. We went there. She ordered sushi because she likes sushi. I don't like sushi, so I didn't order sushi, even though we're at a fucking Japanese place. I ordered katsu chicken, which is basically the skinniest uh, deep fried piece of chicken that you can get with fried rice. Because I just wanted, uh, I just wanted basically a Panda Express experience in a sushi bar vibe, which is basically what I got, and. I get my food. They bring out my food, and I'm I'm sitting. I'm like, well, I'm gonna wait for my girlfriend to get her food, right? And she's like, no, go ahead and eat. I'm like, well, eat it with me. So we're splitting the food, doing it all cute, and uh, you know, we take a little break because we're not gonna eat the whole thing. We're you know, we're waiting for her food, and then we'll you know, we'll go into eating and just waiting and waiting. She's bringing food to other tables. I'm like, cool. She's bringing drinks. She's taking orders. She's doing things. And I'm not mad at the waitress because it's not her fault how long the food took at all but i'm just watching her i'm like when is this food ready because we've been fucking sitting here for a minute and uh finally the california whatever fucking crunch roll comes out and when we get done eating i get the bill and uh yeah not only was the sushi very late it was more expensive than what it said on the menu i was like what the fuck is this and she was like oh that's because you got the specialty rolls. I'm like, oh, I got the specialty rolls? Oh, the specialty sushi rolls. Uh, what was special about them? The fact that they took twice as long to make? Is that why they're twice as expensive? And uh, let's just say this. I didn't put up a fight. I just paid for it and fucking left because I'm a man and I don't need to make a scene. Don't need to make a scene. Not that women make scenes, but I didn't need to make one. So I just paid and left like a man. And took the leftovers home. Long story short, Austin has been expensive so far because the sushi bar killed me. Motherfucking, <laughs> I'm trying to even figure out where we went yesterday. Oh, the food we got at the at the show yesterday was expensive too. I got bangers and mash, and the, yeah, I don't know how. I don't know if they charged me in pounds because the bangers and mash, which was good at LT's Pub in Lakeway, real good bangers and mash, expensive. Okay, and 460 for a Heineken Zero, by the way. And this isn't just LT's Pub. This is everywhere. Okay, you're going to charge me full price for a beer with no alcohol. I understand it's my fault that I can't drink alcohol because I'm an alcoholic. That's on me. But it's on you also. How many Heineken Zeros do you really sell? You can't sell them to me at cost? Look at me. I'm a fucking alcoholic. Please, just sell me a Heineken Zero at cost. They don't do it, though. And I know why they don't fucking do it. Because they know that if you're drinking Heineken Zero, you're going to drink like one, maybe two of those things. They're not doing deals on that non-alcoholic beer. They're not doing it. Because you're not getting drunk. You're not going to buy a bunch of drinks. When you get lit, when you get super drunk, guess what you're going to do? Probably buy a fuckload more drinks. So I can afford to have lower margins if I'm selling you 15 drinks because you're an alcoholic. But when you're a recovering alcoholic, you're only going to have one or two drinks. So, yeah, I should be happy that I didn't spend that much. But it's, I don't know. Bangers and mash were expensive. Very good, though. Very good. <sighs> I've been in Austin a day and a half. I think I've been high the entire time off CBD. And it's it's been it's been a blur. I was talking to Justin Essemacher about this the other day. It is the blur, as I call it. I was talking to Philip about this too, Philip Garcia. Since he came down for that Kill Tony where he went up and murdered, and then he got on the Vulcan show that Thursday, and then he got rebooked last night for the Vulcan show. That's where we're hang, uh, hanging out with him there. He told me, he's like, since then, he's like, dude, I feel like I haven't taken it, but I've just been doing shows and going everywhere. And he's like, and I was like, yeah, it's called the blur, it's the blur of success. And basically, the way it works is. You get funneled up into this successful stream of things that's happening in your life. And it's happening for good reason. It's not just random. It's happening because you're making them happen. You're doing the right things. And this blur of success, you get caught up in it. And as long as you keep it going, you keep that success ball in the air, you're not even going to realize how quickly things are happening for you. They're just going to happen. 
And people get caught up in this and they, they, they're like, oh my God, I haven't been able to take a break. I'm like, that's called the blur of success. The blur of success is very important. That's how you get stuff done. That's how this country was built, okay? The blur of success. And that's how I got down to Austin, man. I remember, you know, the first time we came down here for Kill Tony and Jenny killed it and she got booked on The Secret Show, right? I go, we, we went home back to Dallas and I was like, I think we got to move to Austin. I think we got to make this happen, right? That's what, the whole reason we came to Texas was to move to Austin. And I, you know, all of a sudden we go down there the first week and Jenny kills it and shit. And I'm like, we should probably go to Austin, right? We should probably just figure out how to move there. So I just start looking it up. And I just, I find a place, I pull a trigger, and boom, now I'm here, right? That's how quickly that shit happens. But it's all part of the blur. It's all part of just doing the shit, okay? Too many people get caught in analysis paralysis or just fucking second-guessing themselves and shit. And look, it's not a bad thing to second-guess yourself ever. But a lot of times, people really just second guess themselves into oblivion i'm like you gotta just pull the trigger pull the trigger okay shooters shoot that's what i talked about last week and i was talking about mass shooters school shooters whatever kind of shooters you're into but shooters shoot okay nobody gets remembered as a school shooter if they don't pull the trigger that's a fact. We know about that. The only reason we know Columbine is because somebody pulled the trigger. Okay? If we want to know about you, you got to pull a trigger. And that is not to encourage you to shoot anything because <laughs> it's really just about doing shit in life. If you want to do something, you should do it. You should make it happen. You don't shoot anything up. Don't shoot anybody up. Don't kill anybody. Love people. That's what it's all about. I hope nobody, nobody's going to, but that could easily be taken out of context. That could, so, <laughs> that could so easily be taken out of context. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It could be taken out of context. Yeah. The video I made last week was just me singing ridiculous shit about the shooters. And I posted it. And it didn't really get a lot of views. But I still thought it was hilarious. That's my thing about social media. I'm only posting what I think is funny. I'm done. I quit Instagram. I pretty much quit Facebook. Right, I'm just on Twitter because it's the only one I enjoy. Why do I have to do Instagram? I, mean, I was talking to Philip about this earlier. I was like, "Why do I have to do Instagram?" He's like, "It's like your publicist." I'm like, "Yeah, but my publicist could just be Twitter because on Twitter you can post pictures." And I think the big thing he was saying was like, "Dude, you just have to have an account. You don't have to be crazy active on the shit. You just have to have an account." And I was like, "All right." Just an account? Just an account. So, he inspired me. I might make another account. I don't know. I don't fucking know. I don't know. I hate Instagram. It sucks. It's it's not a fun app for me. Neither is Facebook. I deleted the Facebook app. I still have the account. Maybe that's what it is. I still, like, I still have Facebook, right? I never go on it. I occasionally post a link to this on there. But I don't go on Facebook. I'm not active on Facebook. I'm not making posts, liking posts, commenting on posts. Because I have a life. But I have the account. And really, it's just for Messenger. And I see that a lot of people use Instagram as Messenger too. So I'm like, okay, well, why don't, why don't, why don't I just make one maybe just for the Messenger aspect of it? And uh, just post, you know, random shit. Once a week maybe. That's, I think that's what we uh, concluded. Once a week. You post once a week. You're living your life. You're living your life. That's what it's all about. It's all about living your life, man. Speaking of someone who I think has lived plenty of life. It is time to get into this week's Porn Star of the Podcast. It is none other than... Oh, shit. Sorry, sorry. Getting off track. There we go. Here it is. This week's Porn Star of the Podcast. Give it up for none other than Rachel Starr. Don't have the soundboard. Can't do the claps, but Rachel Starr. Here we go. The bio is brought to you by Pornhub because they have hilarious bios. Rachel Starr, 
If you're looking for a well-seasoned babe that can embody the hot, bitchy boss and the submissive secretary, look no further than Rachel Starr. This superstar porn babe has got many classic moves, but one of her best is that kinky office position. Bent over the desk, perfectly still upper body and dat ass, just rocking it up and down like it has its own motor. Rachel Starr has got one serious bubble butt that's going to make you pop faster than you can say twerk it, baby. But Lady Starr isn't just about the backdoor trigger effect. She also has an all-around sweetheart, tattooed in teddy bears, flowers, and colorful birds. She's rumored to be everybody's best friend in Bangtown and one hell of a hard worker to booty. Take a few seconds to scroll her Twitter account or read the comments on her scenes and you can feel the love muscles throb for her. She's got more coming, but keep she's got more coming to keep the fans coming all the time as Rachel begins to dominate genres like MILF and domination of both cocks and pussies. You can see her working in any of the top studios and loving every moment of hot, sweaty jock riding and muff munching. All in all, this tan, leggy, boss-ass superstar deserves every inch of praise and every squirt of stardom. Rachel Starr, the extra R, is for a run home and play with yourself just thinking about her. That is Rachel Starr. A little bit more about Rachel Starr. She is from Dallas, Texas. Shout out to the DFW. Again, I love you. She started porn in 2007. Uh, she was born in Burleson, Texas. Not sure exactly where that is. She's 5'4", 123 pounds, 34 double D, 26, 36. She has fake boobs. She has an OnlyFans. It is OnlyFans.com slash Rachel Starr. That's R-A-C-H-E-L-S-T-A-R-R triple X. So again, Rachel Starr, Rachel just with the E, Starr with two R's, and then the double X. So that is Rachel Starr, this week's porn star of the podcast. And if you haven't heard of her, where have you been? What have you been jerking off to? That's what I want to know. Sometimes I do these and, uh, you know, people have never heard of the porn star and I'm like, what are you jerking off to, bro? Like Rachel Starr? You don't know about Rachel Starr? What the fuck? Like Lisa Ann? Everybody should know Lisa Ann. Everyone should know Vanessa Blue. That's why I put her on the very first episode. But Rachel Starr, if you don't know her, I you know, you clearly don't love porn. Not like I do. Um, and I do, again, I want to shout out to the DFW area, the home of Rachel Starr, and the home of probably many porn stars, more than you might think. More than you might know. I know we talked to one. We've talked to a couple on this podcast. It's been very fun. Been very interesting. I've had a good time doing it. And, uh, you know, and I've heard rumors that the famous Rachel Starr will be hanging around different bars by Lake uh, Louisville, over by where I used to live. But like I said, I'm down in Austin now, baby. And that's why I sound more nasally than I normally do because, excuse me, the allergies, the fucking allergies, the fucking allergies in this goddamn town are insane. I don't give a shit about a vaccine for COVID because I want to figure out how do we not have a vaccine for seasonal nasal allergies. I think this affects way more Americans than COVID. I think it affects more Americans than cancer. How do we not have a cure for seasonal nasal allergy? You know what I think it is? I think it's big pharma. Obviously, we know that. We know it's big pharma. It's Zyrtec and Claritin. They're the Coke and Pepsi of this bullshit and they fuck with you. Take Claritin. Take Zyrtec. Fuck you, okay? I want a cure, and I want one now. I want a task force. I want Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to create a task force called Ending Seasonal Nasal Allergy Oppression because millions of Americans of every race, creed, gender, and everything else that you can divide people by Every one of us suffers from this shit. Seasonal nasal allergies are the fucking worst. Okay? They make it sound like you're sick. They make you feel like shit. Not sick sick, but just runny nose. Just snot running down your nose. It's fun. It's a good time. Uh, And on top of that, it makes you sound more nasally than you already are. Look, I have a deviated septum. I'm from the Midwest. I have a lot of things going against me in terms of how I sound. I sound nasally. Just is what it is. 
but then seasonal nasal allergies come around and they're like you know what buddy i'm gonna ratchet it up a bit and i'm like you know what buddy i can't deal with this shit it's frustrating it really is it really truly is but you know what are you gonna do about it what are you gonna do about it i don't fucking know i don't know what are you gonna do i'm gonna bitch and complain about it how about that i'm gonna do that that's what i'm gonna do I'm going to bitch and complain, and I'm going to do it on a podcast. <sighs> you know, um, this new house that I've moved into, roommates, by the way, very cool. Very cool roommates. Um, but it's funny because there's a lot of, like, decoration stuff around the house, right? There's, you know, little cutesy stuff. There's plants and little, like I said, decorations and books. And it looks like people live here. When I moved into Dallas, Texas, Frisco to be specific, at my homeboy's house, Mr. J.D. Poe, shout out J.D. Poe Studios, I love J.D. Poe, he's awesome. When I moved in there, it looked like it was a fucking model house. It was more, it looked like it was a freshly built house because there were no, nothing anywhere. No artwork, no plants, no nothing. It was the most single dude living in a three bedroom, two bath that I've ever seen in my life. And it was hilarious. I had a great time living there. We talked about it. So this upcoming week's episode of Open Mics, uh, we did a we did a going away. It was myself, Genevieve, uh, talking to Justin Essamacher and uh, JD Poe, and we talked about living there. It was a funny podcast. We did it as the sun was setting. It's a beautiful podcast, actually. It's very beautiful. It's very cool. Um, but uh, it was just it was hilarious talking about the experience of living there. Because it was really unique. It was very interesting. I had a lot of fun. And I'm excited for this new adventure down here in Austin. But it's fun to reflect on uh, on Dallas. And it is kind of fitting that the last show that we did in Dallas was technically in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And it was wild. Like I said, it was straight up fucking wild. Because <laughs> just the horse in the bar... Just, it's always a rowdy crowd in Ardmore. It always is fun. It's always pretty rowdy and fun and a good time. And again, you know, everybody's up there. Everybody's having fun. And then at the very end of the night, a horse in the bar. And you're just like, God damn it. This fucking shit, dude. That's some shit you don't see in LA. Okay? You're not going to see that shit in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. I don't think anybody's going back to LA. I'm going to be very honest with you. I know there's a lot of people holding out hope. They're like, people are going to come back. No, no, once, once the pandemic, once everybody's vaccinated, people are going to come back to LA. People are coming back. They're not. They're not. They're buying houses, building houses, and building a real life in Texas. It's happening. And nobody's going back to California. I'm sorry, Gavin Newsom. Nobody's coming back. I'm sorry, Mayor Garcetti. Nobody's coming back. Nobody's coming back. Um, Michigan already knows that. Nobody goes back to Michigan anyway. Uh, Miss Whitmer. Bleh, you nasty. Miss Whitmer, you nasty. Nobody's going back to Michigan. Nobody's going back to L.A. Some people might go back to New York. But I'm interested to see how Miami develops as a comedy scene. Because I think the difference between Miami and Austin... Austin is already, was before this, already more of an artist hub, mostly live music, country music, and uh, more of a creative hub than Miami. Miami is cocaine money. Miami is wealthy. And Miami is bougie. It's perfect for Andrew Schultz. But let's be honest, not every comedian is Andrew Schultz. Not every comedian is going to be able to just go ball in Miami. And I don't know if they're going to be able to build the same scene that they're building here in Austin. Nashville, on the other hand, I think is going to be interesting because, again, more creative, more of an artist hub. I could see that developing with a guy like Theo Vaughn into a pretty cool comedy scene. It's fun to watch. This is what capitalism really is. It's the flow of of money really right and you're seeing when this when this pandemic happened right the free market actually took hold a lot of people think the government did but the free market is stronger than the government it really is because the free market is like water right water is going to flow to where it can flow the money is going to flow to where the money really wants to be so low taxes 
right? Wherever there's low taxes, money's going to flow there. Wherever there's more freedom, people and money are going to flow there, right? People and their money are going to flow to places with freedom. So given what happened with COVID, given what happened with all of this, nobody should be surprised at the movement of people from places like New York and LA to places like Miami and Austin. It's actually pretty simple when you break it down, right? It's just capitalism. And people try to fight capitalism all the time. It always wins. You know why? Because it's a better system. It's more freedom. The money is going to flow there. Even China has become more capitalistic. From an economic standpoint, they've actually found a way to be economically more capitalist while at the same time maintaining mental control over their people. Right, they've maintained all that censorship and all those things. Right, they've gotten rid of a lot of people's freedom, while still being able to take advantage of how capitalism works from an economic standpoint. Right, innovation and being able to sell your products all around the world. They do that very well, and it's because of the way they look at things economically. I'm not here to defend China. But, I mean, if you look at China of the last 20 years versus China of the 30 years before that, different policies, different results. Just is what it is. That being said, I think the United States of America economically needs to get back to just being American, baby. You know what I'm saying? Just making shit dope. We don't make enough dope shit anymore. You know? And it doesn't have to be the highest quality. But it has to be uniquely and identifiably American. I can't think of anything other than maybe like pickup trucks that are still like American. <laughs> Ooh, excuse me. Budweiser still gets it done. Budweiser's still very American. McDonald's still very American. But... Oh, dude, these allergies again. These allergies are very American. They're pissing me off. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think like from an economic standpoint, we need to get back into make, making America dope again. That's really what it is. Make America dope again. Because it's like, why would you want to buy American stuff right now? It's not the best quality. So if you're a quality person, you're not going to buy it. It's never the best price. So if you're a price person, you're never going to buy that. And it's almost never... It used to be more so like this, but nowadays it's not even the most cool thing you can have, right? Like the coolest shit isn't American anymore. And that's the problem because cool is where America used to always be able to compete. But once America can't compete on being cool, we're fucked. We are fucked. It's all we had going for us. America is like the kid in high school who's just cool as shit. But once high school's over, he's not cool anymore. You're just a loser. America is a fucking somebody who peaked in high school. This is what America is, baby. We peaked. Did America peak? Is that crazy to think? America may have peaked. That's so fucking nuts. And it might be very true. It might be completely true. America might have just peaked. We don't know. It's hard to say right now. I think a lot of people have been predicting the downfall of America. They've been praying on our downfall. Let's be honest, y'all. They've been praying on America's downfall. They prayed on my downfall. Shout out T Grizzly. Shout out Detroit. Okay. Detroit's going to be in the building, by the way. April 11th, Creek in the Cave. Sunday, 8 o'clock. Darius Bennett of the Motown Laugh Kings of the Comedy Store in Los Angeles. Darius Bennett will be headlining Afro Sundays, the inaugural Afro Sunday show hosted by Genevieve. Uh, very heavy Detroit presence on that show. That's going to be Sunday, April 11th. Like I said, uh, I will post a ticket link whenever we get a ticket link. Still working on it. Creek in the Cave, Still, they're still working on it. Uh, they, had a, they had a great opening night last night. Um, and, uh, you know, they're going to have shows this whole weekend and then next whole weekend. It's going to be great. Creek in the Cave is going to be fucking sweet. If you haven't been there yet, go there. Check it out. And, uh, you know, we're working on the ticket link right now. A lot of things, it's, they just literally opened yesterday, April 1st. So uh, still, still still some things in progress. The indoor showroom is still being worked on as well. But the outdoor showroom is fucking sweet. And uh, make sure you guys check it out if you're in Austin. 
But again, April 11th, if you're down here, check it out. It's going to be fucking sweet, dude. I'm very proud of my girlfriend. There's a, you know, some people, I don't know if people talk about that. Like, I'm proud of my girlfriend. She's been doing amazing things, and it's, it's fucking sweet to watch. Because when we met, we were both doing comedy. We were both pretty new, like two, you know, two-ish years into comedy in Detroit. In, in the most fucking hood rooms you can imagine. Like, nobody was giving a shit. This was not Austin, Texas. When we started comedy, we were in the fucking hood. West side, east side of Detroit. Didn't fucking matter. Highland Park. We were still doing Highland Park shows last summer. And not Dallas Highland Park. Highland Park in Dallas, super rich. Highland Park in Detroit makes Detroit look not as poor. Highland Park is the poorest part of Detroit. The most hood part of Detroit. And that's where me and my girlfriend, we used to do shows. All over all over the city and you know seeing someone i mean seeing yourself progress is very cool it's very cool to see yourself progress in something that you care about and that you love and that you work hard at seeing someone you love progress is amazing right because here's this person that you care about and that you spend all this time with and that you you know love and that you um have an interest in and that you that you, you you want them to be you genuinely want them to be successful and you know then when you see it happen you're like this is so freaking cool it's just so cool to see her at the point she is now where she's getting recognized and things like that and getting all these opportunities because i'm like dude that's what hard work can do if you put your mind to something if you try you can you can make it to great heights and I think it should be encouraging to people. Like when you see someone succeed, people have one of two mindsets. When they see other people that they may have started with succeed, people either get jealous or they get happy. Don't get jealous. You should be happy. You should be very excited because it means that it's possible. Like when somebody that you know is successful, you should be happy for them because you get to see that it's possible. Okay. A lot of times, especially for like young comics, I think they're like, dude, this is never going to happen. This is just never going to happen. Like, hopelessness. A lot of people feel hopeless. Not just in comedy, in a lot of things. And that's why it's important to have role models. It's important to have people that you can look at and uh, and be like, see, it can be done. When you see someone who's done great things, you should look at that and be like, so you can do it. It's doable, right? I think that's why we look at Michael Jordan the way we do. Everyone's like, he's the GOAT. He's the GOAT. Tom Brady's the GOAT. Because those are people who proved, no, no, you can do it. Six six rings, two three-peats, it's doable. It's doable to be that great. Tom Brady, seven Super Bowls, yeah, it's doable. He goes to Tampa, wins the Super Bowl. That's fucking badass, dude. I know a lot of people love to hate Tom Brady. And I know I love to love Tom Brady because he went to Michigan. And I know Michigan lost on Monday or Tuesday or whatever in the Elite Eight. And I don't give a shit, okay? I don't care. Because I moved to Austin, I did a show with a horse, and Tom Brady won seven Super Bowls. So I don't give a fuck. I love Michigan basketball, but guess what? Suck my dick. I don't give a shit that they lost. Tom Brady's the GOAT, and he proves that it can be done. You can leave Bill Belichick, and you can go win a fucking Super Bowl with Bruce Arians. Are you kidding me? Brady's the GOAT. Um... But yeah, it's just, you know, uh, LeBron always gets compared to Michael Jordan. And when he won his last championship, he was like, dude, I just want my props. He said that. He was like, I just want my props. I'm like, what props? What props don't we give you, LeBron? We just don't say you're as good as Jordan. You know why? Because you're fucking not. You're not as good as Michael Jordan. No, your career is not over. And you are incredibly great. Those are two facts. Your career is not over and you are incredibly great. But you're not Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was great at a whole nother level than you. And you're great at a whole nother level than anybody else, really. And that's the, I think that's the tough thing for LeBron is like, no matter how great he is, is he going to be able to be as great as Michael Jordan? I think Kobe Bryant faced that too. Um, different journeys for those guys. But like... When you're pursuing greatness, you can't contextualize it in terms of someone else. You have to look at your own life and compare yourself to yourself. I think LeBron, and it, it might not even be his fault, but he was always compared to Michael Jordan right out of high school. And a lot of people 
still compare him to Michael Jordan. And I don't know if that was fair, but it is what happened. Now, LeBron chose to take that comparison on. And that was his choice. And it was, I, I mean, I respect the fact that he has never shied away from the Jordan comparison. He's never been like, dude, we're different players. This, that. He's never shied away from it. He's always been like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna put it all out there and try to be greater than Jordan. And at the end of the day, dude, LeBron will go down as one of the top three greatest players in NBA history, hands down. And, you know, a lot of people will say he's the greatest. I don't think he is. I think Michael Jordan still is. I would put LeBron two, maybe three after Kobe. I think Kobe Bryant to me is number two. Then I would go with LeBron, probably number three. Number four, God, it is tough. It is very tough. I mean, you look at Magic Johnson. You look at guys like Larry Bird, Kareem, Shaq, so many great players. Um, If I had to round out number four, greatest of all times, um, I might still go Magic Johnson. And then number five, I might even go Steph Curry. I might go Steph Curry at number five. Three rings, pretty impressive. Um, People talk about Kevin Durant. (sighs) Steph. For me, Steph Curry. Dude, unreal. Unreal player. But again, yeah, there's there's so many uh, so many great players in NBA history. It's hard to stack them up. But at the end of the day, to me, it's always still Michael Jordan. It's always still Michael Jordan. And you know, I don't want to get too into the stats, but just look at his scoring per game. Just go if you really care about the Michael Jordan Lebron comparison. You just have to go look at their scoring. And people love talking about assists. They love talking about assists. Michael Jordan was a fucking scorer. The greatest scorer of all time. He was a winner. The, in my opinion, one of the greatest winners of all time. He was one of the best defensive players of his era. LeBron, very good defensive player. Is he on Jordan's level? I don't know. Is he on Kawhi Leonard's level? I don't know. You know, we always we always take LeBron's defense for granted, but... I do think, at the end of the day, he's not one of the all-time elite defenders in NBA history. I don't think I would classify him there, but I would Michael Jordan. And defense makes goats. Except Tom Brady. He's just a goat. It's what it is. Thank you guys very much for listening to this week's episode of Porn and Capitalism. New episode every Saturday, as I said, April 11th. Make sure you check out Afro Sundays with Genevieve. Headliner Darius Bennett for that show at Creek in the Cave in Austin. More info coming out soon. Again, thank you for listening. Make sure you have a good weekend. Thanks.